interaction with uh, Kai Wieser and uh, he's telling about uh, how, how renormalization group can help uh, bootstrap and uh, please Kai. Yeah, thanks uh, Raul. Thanks for organizer. <laughs> thanks to, the, to all of you for being here. Um, so originally uh, this was a talk which uh, uh, was supposed to be given by Mikhail Kompanietz, my favorite specialist in uh, in doing uh, perturbative RG calculations at a uh, high order. Sadly, he is uh, ill, so he cannot give the talk. So I try to do my best to, um, uh, to replace him. And of course, I will, well, I will give a slightly different uh, perspectives from uh, his own. Uh, so I will also touch on some um, uh, stuff I recently did with Andrei Fedorenko and Asaf Shapiro uh, concerning the um, ON model for N equals minus two. So let us uh, remind uh, how we do a perturbative RG and here on the uh, example of the ON model, so typical phi four theory. So you do perturbation theory in the coupling which uh, gives you effective scale dependent uh, uh, parameters G for the coupling and for whatever you have here, for instance, for this uh, parameter uh, M square. Now, when you uh, change the scale, so in, you integrate out the fast modes of freedom, then uh, the effective uh, coupling constant uh, is uh, changing and the moving along this uh, RG uh, trajectory until going to the fixed point uh, here. So the, what you do is you calculate the beta function perturbatively in the coupling. It's always a perturbative calculation in the coupling. Uh, but the, and, and the coefficients you have here, they are um, universal. So it means up to global normalization uh, the coefficients do not depend on your RG scheme. This is very important in practice for calculations that it, as it hints already at the fact that you have a lot of uh, freedom how to do uh, the RG calculations. And it hints also that there are a lot of tricks uh, how you can do the calculations efficiently. And many of these tricks have been uh, employed by the uh, by the professionals in, in the game, so for instance, Mishar and uh, his collaborators, or Oliver Schnetz, um, who currently holds the world record uh, with an eight loop calculation for the exponent eta. <clears throat> Sorry, Kay, just to make it precise. So the coefficient a2, a3, and so on in the beta are actually scheme dependent. What are scheme independent are the coefficient uh, that you express in the critical exponent when they express in terms of epsilon. These are indeed scheme independent. Yeah, I said up to a normalization. So this, uh, if you- oh, it's not a question of- one. It's not a normalization. Simply, they, they simply change uh, drastically the coefficient. Not the one loop and not the two loop, the higher order one. Yeah, but you have to get omega out correctly. So this is impossible if you change uh, the coefficient. Let's discuss no, no, this, this maybe is, later. This, sorry, this is precisely what happens. This coefficient changed drastically in beta, but the coefficient that you get once you plug it back in terms of epsilon on critical exponent, these are universal. And they are universal because in fact are, are supposed to be scheme independent. But the actual coefficient of the beta function, I mean, it's well known to that they change if you change scheme. No? So, okay, sorry, just a, a little. Comment. Yeah, we should discuss this later because it's it's uh, not important for what I want to say. Um, so this is perturbative in, in the coupling, but then you have a, a fixed point G star, and um, the 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 fixed point admits an expansion in uh, epsilon just by inverting this. Uh, equation here where you have the first term which is epsilon g and second and i mean and the uh, and the polynomial expansion in, in in the coupling constant and by doing so whenever you uh, 
I mean, what you calculate in the in the uh, epsilon, I mean, in the, in the ex expansion as a function, you calculate the exponents, the effective exponents as a function of g, but then you have to insert the fixed point at g star, uh, and then this becomes an epsilon expansion. This epsilon expansion is uh, is uh, I mean, it's unique. So that's that's the way um, perturbative RG uh, works. When you are somewhere on the RG flow, and if you go to an experiment, you might want you may actually see these effective exponents, uh, but um, this is not a scale invariant and certainly not a conformally invariant uh, theory. But it might be interesting to 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 know where this RG trajectory goes. So it starts always at the free theory. And here I've drawn the trajectory for the easing model. So it runs along this trajectory and then uh, it goes, it ends up at the, the easing model. And you see it, uh, it's, it's outside the, the, the large region. But again, this is not surprising because these are not even scale invariant uh, theories. So in calculating the exponents relevant for on, on this curve here, uh, I had, of course, to uh, sum up the perturbation expansion I've uh, written here, which is an epsilon expansion. And the problem is that uh, quite in general and unavoidably, the perturbation expansion is not a convergent series in epsilon. This is um, uh, this is a result of the uh, perturbation expansion not being uh, convergent as a function of the coupling constant g, and this is much easier to understand. And you can already see this in this toy example here, where you write write down a Gaussian integral, and then you uh, add the term minus g x to the four. So this integral will be very well defined for all positive g. It's not defined for negative g. And you can probably analytically continue it in the complex plane. So the function i of g defined here will look, uh, I mean, its analytic structure will look like this. So it's defined on the real axis. You can continue it. But you have a branch cut singularity starting at uh, the uh, origin. Uh, so this means that you cannot have a convergent uh, expansion in G because then you can you could evaluate it at slightly negative G that would give you a well-defined answer whereas uh, this object is not defined. And you see this in the in the expansion here. Um, you see this factorial of n uh, appearing here, which is a sign that the series is not. Uh, not converging. Well, here I've calculated this coefficient simply by uh, combinatorics. So you can calculate the expectation value of x to the 4n. Uh, but in general, I mean, if, if this were a field theory example, this uh, tool is not at your disposition. Um, but you can always do a subtle point analysis. So let me show how this works for this toy example. So you just write x for the perturbation to the power of n, uh, bring up this x to the four and the exponential, what is written here. And now you see if you rescale x in order to uh, get a factor, uh, factor of n in front of the x square, uh, as is done here, you can do a subtle point analysis for large n. Well, there's a subtle point, there's a fluctuation of the subtle point. The most important thing is that you generate a factor which is 2n uh, log n, which just comes from the rescaling of x by square root of n. Uh, it, it appears here, and it gives you a factorial of n, the factor of n factorial square. You have the one of n factorial, which comes from the exponential function. This n factorial uh, square uh, gives you together an n factorial, which is the factor you have seen here. And this is very general. Imagine writing down the complete path integral for uh, free or P P theory, putting here the Gaussian action and here the 
perturbation, you can again put it in the exponential and do the subtle point analysis, and you will get exactly the same uh, behavior. So seeing this 2n log n here comes from the fact that uh, that the interaction is of the form x to the four. If you had x to the six here, you would get a free n here, so you would get one more n factorial. <clears throat> so this is always the, the same uh, mechanism. And the way to deal with that is you, you introduce a Borel transform, uh, which is uh, nothing but dividing by uh, n factorial. Well, you see, then uh, you will have a finest radius of convergence given by uh, with a radius of convergence given by one over 16. Uh, so the series will converge here in this uh, yellow disk. And you have pushed the branch cut, which started at zero, you have pushed it out to minus one over 16 in, in this case. Now, if you can resum the series inside this disk and analytically continue to infinity, then you can use this inverse parallel transform to reconstruct the, the, the function you, you were aiming for. And this is easy to see, just write down the term of uh, order tg to the n when you do the, the integral of e to the minus t you get back the n factorial by which you had divided here so the the thing is how do you best do this analytic continuation on the whole uh, real axis which you need in this integral here so there are very there are various techniques the simplest one is a uh, uh, Padere summation on the Borel transformed uh, function, which also goes under na the name Padere Borel. In general, it's um, it's not the most reliable uh, technique because when you do a um, Padere resummation, you have a polynomial in the numerator and the polynomial in the denominator. So if the polynomial in the denominator has zeros, you will get poles on the real axis, which will screw up your results. Even having poles close to the axis, uh, in practice, uh, this does not uh, work. So what works better is a conformal transformation, which maps infinity uh, to exactly this point here. So what you do, I mean, the, this conformal mapping by this at the same time maps this branch cut here onto this green circle. So this minus infinity will be mapped to this point while well, together with plus infinity and the, the other side of the branch cut will be mapped here. Then you redo your Taylor expansion, which now uh, converges around zero, insert this into the uh, into your computer program and uh, do the resummation. So this depends on what you insert here for the beginning of the branch cut. So if you put in the branch cut, which is uh, an estimate for the branch cut, which is too close to the origin, well, it will work, but it will converge bad badly. So it's not a good thing to do. If you estimate the branch cut of starting here, then it will not even uh, converge, which you might not see because in, in practice you have, uh, well, if you're lucky, you have six orders of the perturbation expansion at your disposal. One thing you can uh, try, which works, which is, which is very robust, is that uh, you say, well, uh, let's take a functional form like this and try to estimate uh, this constant here knowing that this is uh, gross like n factorial, you estimate this constant here, you use this for the branch cut, and you can even try to guess then the, the next orders in the perturbation expansion. And this uh, gives you a, a very decent uh, resummation. Uh, Companions and uh, Panzer have uh, developed a procedure with uh, several more free uh, resummation parameters. For instance, uh, you can, instead of dividing by n factorial, you can divide by gamma of n plus b. 
you have additional parameter B, and you can use this to optimize. So in practice, what they are doing, they do this for several parameters, they try then to find a region which is the least sensitive for a variation of the parameters. And this is also the method which is the only one uh, if you want to give at least some um, estimates of the error bars. The error bars cannot be uh, uh, exact because, um, well, if there is an analytic contribution at order uh, 10, uh, it would be just added to this function, and there is no way to estimate this in advance, of course. But in practice, it gives you some idea for the for the error bars. There's a recent technique known under the name Maya G resummation, which is actually quite uh, quite pretty. So what you try to do is you take uh, the series you have here and you uh, fit it fit it to a um, I mean, you, you, you try to find a hypergeometric function which fits this series co coefficients which you know. And uh, so you have, to, you have to choose a specific hypergeometric function, uh, well, one which has an, the same number of parameters in the numerator and in the denominator. Let's uh, keep it a little bit vague. And uh, the hypergeometric function, you can then do the inverse Borel transform analytically, which gives a Meyer. Uh, G function. So this works also very well, very well if you are lucky, meaning that you have no spurious poles on the in the hypergeometric function on the on the axis here. So you have a little bit the same problem you had in in Padi Borel. If it works, it works very well, but uh, you cannot be sure that it will work um, well. But taking all these uh, transformations together, comparing them, finally, you get a, a quality of uh, your extrapolation, which is comparable to what you have in, in normal uh, series. Um, and it's much better than, for instance, the body resummation. We have seen this slide in- uh, Kai, Kai, can I ask a question? Yes uh <clears throat> but in many cases the the high order asymptotics of this series are known so is it practical to just determine the asymptotics in every case that you need and then you know exactly where gce is so you don't need to estimate it is this a good way to, to proceed um it's i mean it's theoretically it's much more appealing to to, to solve the instant on equation for the settle point the equivalent of this year. Um, in practice, uh, you may not be in the asymptotic region. This may be true for order twenty, and then uh, in practice, it's more it's more reliable to to estimate uh, your parameters yourself. Oh, but what does it mean? I mean, suppose that theoretically you know that GC should be ten, and you estimate it so consistently, and you find five. And you say you're not in a symptotic regime. I mean, how are we supposed to interpret this? Should you use 10 or 5? Well, using 5 gives you decent results in the resummation. And the... yeah, but, but maybe it's just garbage because if if we, if it doesn't agree with the well asymptotics, then maybe some there are some other terms out there that you don't even know, which can change the result at order one. Actually, uh, nobody knows uh is is true or not you could have an an initial contribution G, um, epsilon to the 10 which is even outside um, in the, the asymptotics of the series there's no way you can know about this term before i calculate it. you cannot know So there are some cases, yeah. there are some perturbative expansions, not maybe in this business, but in other um, areas of physics, where people actually manage to compute sufficiently many terms so that they see that they're already in the asymptotic regime. Yeah, and here, I mean, I didn't prepare this, but uh, for the example, I will show. Uh, okay, uh, just give me. 
I come back to this in, in, in two minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. um, because we'll come in the comment. Uh, well, maybe I make my comment and then I let you make your comment. Okay. Um, so here, just look at this. Uh, if you try to do Pade, um, to approximate this diverging series by Pade uh, approximate with order epsilon to the five, I mean, you get answers all over the place. And the Borel resumed here with some error bars, um, which come from uh, playing with the freedom you have in, in uh, setting up your resummation procedure gives you a completely different answer. So the curve will go some, somewhere here. Um, here I want to show one example, which is a fractal dimension of uh, the propagator line. I will define this a little bit later. Um, and you see the estimation here in three dimensions uh, with error bars, which are pretty uh, small and you can compare to simulations. Uh, this works incredibly uh, well. Now, you can, of course, also go to two dimensions. In two dimensions, you know that uh, the analytic result is given by this uh, black dash curve here. So the ON model becomes massive for N larger than two or smaller than minus two. So this curve actually stops here at a singularity. And what uh, the different uh, randomization procedures have uh, tried, uh, uh, give here is well, it's a decent, maybe decent approximation, but it's not a good or very good approximation in two dimensions, despite the fact that it did pretty well in three dimensions. So here you reach the limits of uh, this uh, extrapolation. And if you don't, I mean, there is some singularity here appearing, and this the it would be uh, too much asked for the epsilon expansion uh, to know this and to incorporate this uh, uh, carefully when, I mean, to, uh, properly, if you, um, if you can't even come up with a simple parameterization of uh, I mean, expansion around uh, this, uh, this curve um, here. So Marco, you wanted to do, to give a, yeah, yeah, sorry. I, sorry. I had the comment on the previous uh, on, on this uh, GC. Uh, I wanted to just uh, say that there is a bit of over, uh, over emphasis on these uh, values. So let me say precisely what I mean. So the large order, uh, this, com this computation that you are reviewing, tell us the location of the leading singularity of the Borel function. And this is in fact very important uh, typically. So that's okay. But in general, uh, there might be other singularities. Actually, there will be other singularities which are more far away from the origin, but eventually you, you, you will need to know where they are. So in principle, unless all your singularities are all aligned along the negative real axis, and this seems to be the case for the specific if I do the four theory, very specific to this theory, the, unless this is what happens, then uh, I mean, you can, there is no need really to compute this uh, GGC. You don't even need to do that because the conformal mapping will be unavailable. You will, uh, you, in order to do a conformal mapping, you need to map, uh, just to be sure that all the other singularities will be mapped at the, at the boundary of the disk. This is only true if you are on the negative real axis. So I believe that there is this overemphasis is because this seems to work very well for the five to the four theory, but in general, that's not the case. So that, that's only, it, even in the five to the four, there is no theorem. I mean, we use it. It, it, it's great, but nobody has proven that all the saddle, the next two leading saddles are aligned, have a, a negative, have a real action. So this is still a few issues, it's still an assumption. Yeah, very, uh, you can underestimate GC. So if you uh, assume that the branch cut starts here at say at uh, GC over two, you still get a decent uh, resummation. I mean, you get a little bit less accuracy. But still, uh, if you know more orders, you will still converge to the to the correct result, for instance. So it's not it's not uh, too uh, sensitive. And the other thing, I mean, I've suggested to you by this calculation that it's asymptotic in G, so it's it has some Borel behavior. For the epsilon expansion, it's a little bit more tricky because 
for the epsilon expansion, I have to first solve um, uh, the, the fixed point equation. So that this is still uh, an asymptotic expansion. It's uh, this has, as Marco was saying, has not been uh, proven. Okay. So um, this was what I wanted to say about resummation. So if you have no more questions, I will go maybe on. So there's another um, very interesting, important concept I would like to remind, which goes back to Franz Wegner, this uh, 1974 paper, and which today we would formulate on, on the path integral. Uh, so when you write the path integral, you have written on the uh, partition function, but it also works for observables. This path integral is invariant under the shift of one of the integration variables. So say phi of x, you shift to delta phi of x, uh, which means that when you do this uh, uh, little perturbation, this object here is, uh, has, to, uh, has to vanish. Has to vanish at least as, as long as possible observables you insert are away from this point x. So this is a, one example of what Wigner called a redundant operator. It's also the equation of motion of uh, this action, but the transformation is actually more general. So since you can uh, shift phi to phi plus delta phi multiplied by an arbitrary function of f of phi, then you get this more general uh, relation here. Uh, so at the Gaussian fixed point, uh, this would also be satisfied. You just have to put uh, g equals zero. And it means that uh, if you calculate the correlation function involving phi, um, this you can do by the Wick theorem, and then you apply Laplacian phi of this correlation function. Uh, this has, this is vanishing. So the generalization of this is this uh, this equation of motion. Um, well, this equation here, and more general, all the redundant operators you get you get by this. I'm mentioning this here, and I'm stressing this here because um, I've seen many papers uh, in my work as a reviewer where people didn't know about this, and uh, then they screw up their whole uh, uh, RG scheme. So I wanted to show one example where you can put this to work and um, connect with something you know very well in, in the bootstrap, and it's for the long range uh, easing model. So the uh, so here you see in your favorite uh, plot with a cusp for the easing um, CFT at this corner here. You see also drawn the Gaussian free field, what you call the generalized Gaussian free field. And uh, starting at this point where the dimension of uh, sigma is uh, three quarters, there is this line of fixed, point, fixed points for the long range easing model. So where you have this uh, phi four interaction uh, and uh, uh, the way this is done, you just add this, um, this term to, to, to your action. And the two loop expansion, while well, it goes right through the easing model, well, I, I admit I, I use the freedom. Uh, I know that this has to end at the uh, CFD for the easing model in order to adjust one parameter so that the plot looks as perfect as it does. Uh, and in this model now, in this RG treatment, you have to take care of two, um, elasticities, the long range elasticity and the short range elasticity. The long range elasticity cannot be renormalized because you can't generate these uh, fractal derivatives um, acting on the field. The short range elasticity is uh, renormalized. And then the question is, well, which of these uh, two wins? So at the, if you're at the long range fixed point, the short range interaction will renormalize uh, to zero, despite the fact that it gets perturbative corrections, which actually push it upwards. And uh, the opposite scenario is when uh, the, well, when you decrease delta sigma, so you go beyond 
this point, then it will grow. It would bring you to the to the easing fixed point, and in that case, the uh, the long range elasticity here becomes uh, irrelevant. So you see, when I write down the redundant operators for this action here, there are actually two different uh, uh, operators I will write down for depending whether it's a short range or the long range uh, fixed point. So what this indicates us is that you expect the rearrangement of your spectrum when you go along this line and you uh, um, end up at the easing fixed point. Uh, of course, uh, uh, well, of course, I mean, the RG just knows about this line here, doesn't know about all the other uh, conformal feed theories around here, and also the other conformal feed theories which just happen to have the same exponents. Uh, but I think it's still instructive that, uh, that the RG can, can make you this uh, rearrangement of the spectrum which you see in the in the also in in, in your um, numerical bootstrap you see it when you walk along along this this line and then you get to the to the easing fixed uh, points questions to this oh and i forgot to say um there is a expansion also um from, from this paper by Behan, Krasteli, Rishkov, and Zan. So they, they can expand around the, the easing fixed point and they get uh, the, the linear and the first order expansion around this point. And this is the orange line here, and it lies actually on top of the perturbative result. Okay. So this long range elasticity looks a little bit artificial, but actually, um it's something you have uh, you're having every day um and uh well either in your coffee cup or here in the in 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 the water bottle so in this water bottle you see this line here which we call a contact line and uh, the contact line is a minimum energy configuration given the disorder on the on the, on the boundary uh, and to the elastic elasticity of the of the surface so you what you want to minimize is uh, the surface area and this leads to um, this leads to a, a effective elasticity on the circle which is given by 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 this expression um, here so well, I mean, you can also say if you write this in Fourier, the elasticity in the in the bulk theory is uh, like k square, but for the boundary theory, the elastic kernel is a uh, absolute value of k. So this is a fractal um, derivation of the uh, you have in, in in this case. And actually, it's, it's a very interesting experiment. So. Uh, if I show you the, the movie for the disordered community. So if you take a plate uh, and you have the contact line uh, on the plate, and then you push the plate into your into, into the liquid, you see most of the time time the, the plate just seems to, I mean the line just seems to be drifting down. This is when the line is attached uh, by the by the disorder, the defects on the line. And then it does this rapid movement, um, well, which we term avalanche movement. <clears throat> and I will comment on this phenomenology a little bit uh, later. So next, I wanted to uh, go back to the ON model. And there is one object which uh, you know of in the, in the ON model which is the second rank tensor, um, but you may not know that it has actually very interesting physical interpretation. So it tells you whether the propagator line, which starts here at point X and goes to point Z, whether it passes through uh, the point uh, Y. 
And the way thinking about this in perturbation theory or on the lattice, whatever you're more uh, comfortable with, is that when you fix the index here, the index has to propagate along uh, the line. Uh, when I insert this object here, for instance, I insert, uh, well, it would be phi one, phi two. So this index one stops here and the index two uh, propagates up to the final point. And this is sitting in, in a soup of loops, which each has a factor of n, which comes from the sum of the different colors uh, the, the loop uh, can have. So the net most natural realization would be n equals two. This is a nice unitary uh, field theory. And uh, what uh, and people have actually succeeded to measure it's the fractal dimension uh, of uh, the propagator line in a numerical simulation is given here. And this uh, here is uh, fractal, I mean, it's uh, the scaling dimension of this operator in, uh, in the six loop approximation given two different resummation schemes. And you see the degrees are quite uh, nicely with uh, the numerical result. Another example I'm sure you know is a self avoiding polymer, because a self avoiding polymer, um, well, self avoiding polymer, there are no loops around here. So you can, of course, get rid by, of, from the, of the loops uh, by putting n to zero, and then you will just have this line which has the interpretation of a self-avoiding uh, polymer. Can I ask a question, Kai? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. So, so the, the, I just wanted to point out that uh, we are, of course, familiar with this operator for OEM models, and we, we are familiar with its scaling dimension. But uh, we are not very familiar with the fact that the scaling dimension corresponds to some uh, to some fractal dimension of some curves and so on. So you shouldn't take this for granted. No, that's why I try to, to give you this example here. I mean, in particular, but, but, you, you in don't know why this is the case. So, I mean, so in, far in from which, what you said, there is no real explanation why scaling dimension measured as a decay of a two point function should be any, anything to do with fractal dimension of these curves. Okay, uh, let me try to explain again. I have a question. I have a question. So similar. So in which so in which dimension are you here? I'm do, I'm in any dimension. Uh, no, no, but you give numerical results. Yeah, so this is three the, the numerical results are in three dimensions. Okay. I guess yeah, I will comment on two dimensions later. So please um, wait for the, for two dimensions. Okay, so if you accept this image here, what um, I mean, you could even take this operator twice, and you would uh, create uh, uh, two two loops. I think it's suggested that the, the scaling dimension of this operator, I mean, this operator say is one when you are in this realization. Uh, when you're on the loop and it's zero otherwise. So the scaling dimension of this operator gives you the fractal, gives you information on the, um, on the loop. So it tells you what is the probability you start here with uh, your, your curve, which is a fractal object to go through this point and end up here. I mean, it's not clear, Kai, if it's just the scaling dimension, if it's the square of the scaling dimension, if the OP coefficients somehow is, are going to enter, that's not obvious. So this operator from, there gives has to be some computation that convinces us in this. So you can think of this as a lattice model, I mean, the high temperature expansion. Then this operator is, is one when the curve goes through and zero otherwise. So it, it, it calculates the on your lattice exactly the probability that the curve goes through. And from that, when you go to the scaling limit, it has a dimension, and this dimension is a fractal dimension. I think this is a conclusion you will then be able to do yourself. So 
what you need to know is that it gives you it's proportion to the um, probability that the curve goes through this point on the lattice. Is this fine? Well, it's fine to the extent that I have to do it myself. So I was hoping that <laughs> that I would learn something for free, but now I, it seems I have to work to still work hard. It gives you probability. <laughs> It's not very pedagogical, but it's okay. Okay. So up to now, I talked about the XY model. I talked about the voiding polymer or self voiding walks. There are actually two more models on the uh, on the slide here, n equals one is the easing model. And uh, yes, you see that um, the people in the numerical simulation, which was done before we, we uh, did the calculation, so they, they had no theoretical um, background. So they, they gave their best estimate and they didn't know whether it would be any way correct. Uh, so they succeeded to measure the fractal dimension of the propagator line in the easing model. Of course, you can't do this directly in the easing model, so you have to take the ON model and then do the analytic continuation uh, to n equals one. Or alternatively, you can uh, add to the easing model one more family of fermions and one more family of bosons, uh, which will then cancel. I'll remind you our uh, classes from high energy physics or so fermionic loop gives a factor of minus one. Um, so when you use this trick, you can actually add a family of fermions and bosons uh, to this to the easing model. So you have an extension of the easing model. This extension, contrary to the easing model, knows about this operator and allows you to to uh, in the field theory to uh, calculate these fractal dimensions. And uh, in the simulation to well, in the simulation to extract it. The last model I would like to mention is the loop array random walk, which I claim is uh, the ON model, where you put n equals minus two, and I claim this is true in all uh, dimensions. Uh, so probably you're not very familiar with the um, loop array random walk. So let me. Uh, show you a movie of a loop array random walk. So here you see a random walk. And whenever you make a loop, then you erase the loop. So what is erased is the red parts here. And then you want to know, um, for instance, the radius of duration of this object as the as a function of the number of steps. So the radius of duration, the so into end distance, will scale like the square root of the number of steps. Well, that's a standard Brownian motion uh, argument, which tells you that the uh, Brownian motion has a fractal dimension of two. Now, on the other hand, it will scale like the length of the blue line, which is a uh, lupus raised random walk to the power one over Z. So this Z will be the fractal dimension of the loop raised random walk. And in two dimensions, it's known from conformal field theory, and especially from uh, stochastic Loewner evolution, where it was one of the key models, uh, uh, Schramm um, and uh, uh, Werner and uh, uh, Lawler used, uh, I mean, as testing ground for for SLE. Um, so they they proved that this. Uh, that uh, the fractal dimension of luberized random walk is five over four. So in um, in three dimensions, um, this was not known that this equivalence also holds. And uh, well, this is a fractal dimension we got from the uh, from the field theory, and uh, there are quite extraordinary simulations by um, uh, David Nelson. Uh, David Wilson, sorry, uh, which has here two more zeros in uh, in the precision. 
So why the heck should the loop arise random walk resemble to the, to the ON model with N equals minus two? Or let's um, count a little bit differently. So minus two means minus two real bosons. We can also say minus one real, minus one complex boson, or since I said bosons count with the opposite sign as fermion, so this would be one, one fermion. So why the heck should this have anything to do with a fermionic theory? And um, the way you can at least get a glimpse is from writing the, the weight of the looperized random walk, which goes from A to, uh, to C. So remember the looperized random walk, well, here in blue, there are several ways to generate it. I can just go directly. I can make one loop. Since the loop is erased, I will get the same trajectory. I can two loop, make two loops, three loops, and so on. Now, you know, this looks like a geometric series. And the way to uh, resum a geometric series is by multiplying with one minus the contribution of the loop, which is nothing but the fermion partition function on this, uh, on this graph. So you multiply the, with this, all the red stuff goes away. And what remains is uh, the blue object here, which is a fermion propagator on the graph. And what I've written somehow suggestively here is that if you take the probability for a looperized random walk, for a looperized random, the path for looperized random walk, multiply by the partition function of the fermions, then you get the fermion propagator. Um, so this looks like you could write the partition function, well, the propagator, um, as a theory of just one family of fermions. And for the propagator, it's true. For the partition function, is is true. And uh, since this is true, I mean, people have said, okay, well, this is a they gave, gave, give the theory a name, which are which is symplectic fermions. So luberized random walks are symplectic fermions. I strongly oppose this statement because uh, this construction does not give you access to, to the question, did the luberized random walk go through a lattice point? In order to do this, you have to enlarge your uh, theory, which you can do by adding an additional pair of bosons and fermions. So you add up we end up with two fermions and one boson. And this is enough to detect whether a path um, went uh, through, uh, through a lattice point. Well, then you can write down um, the, the generating function on the lattice for these paths. And uh, uh, you will get an exact action, which has this form here. And if you tailor expand, and uh, in the spirit of 5 4 theory, only keep the leading uh, terms, you will end up with a, a 5 4 uh, type uh, theory for the interaction part. You also have the free theory part. And so this represents the. Um, so this is a, well, this is actually a proof which works on any graph. Um, so that you can write an action, and if you go on a regular graph, you can expand this action and uh, go to the field theory uh, limit. So this way you can prove that in any dimension uh, below four dimensions, including four dimensions, the o n model where you put n to minus two uh, represents looperized uh, random uh, walks. So some interesting things about this theory. Well, it looks almost like a free theory. Remember, I, if I do this with one uh, with one fermion, which is enough to get the, the propagator, then I cannot even write down a four-point interaction because uh, the psi bar psi square will will vanish since uh, psi is a, a Grassmann uh, variable. So I need more. Um, more than just one fermion in my multiplet uh, in order to see any non-trivial effects 
And um, so for instance, uh, I have this uh, uh, second rank tensor here. I've given you its fractal dimension in three dimensions. And we also know epsilon prime from the exponent omega of the RG. And it would be very curious to see a, a bootstrap of, uh, of, this, uh, of this theory. So why is this theory so interesting? You, can, you could argue, well, loop arrays random walks that don't really uh, exist in nature. And uh, I've tried hard to find an example of a loop arrays random walk. So the best I, um, I can come up with is to take an end searching for food uh, and um, it leaves a trace behind. And if you send a second end on the, on the same trace, uh, but ask it to always go to the to the branch which has the stronger smell, supposing that the smell slowly uh, evaporates, then it will actually do a loop arrays random walk. So it will not do all the loops because the loops are older than the, the branch uh, you have to, to follow them. It gets a little bit tricky when the, then the trace is uh, crossed uh, itself. So don't nail me down uh, on that. Um, but the, the sphere is interesting because it appears also in the context of disordered systems. And I've shown you here a very big uh, diagram. Um, so up to now, we have looked at loop various random walks. And um, well, the, the feed theory of two fermions on one boson, um, uh, it, um, it's equivalent to. Um, well, then there are many other models or so Laplacian walks, uniform spanning trees. This can all be understood by exact combinatorial, combinatorial arguments. The um, model I would like to focus on now are charge density waves. So charge density waves are disordered systems. So this is, um, well, which is for which the energy I've written down here where the variable u uh, is um, the the is is a phase. So charge density waves. So they are superconducting devices with a with a phase. And the phase, um, well, when you when you increase the phase by two pi and one in my uh, uh, normalization, then of course uh, the the potential you see has to repeat. And um, the RG, which one can write down, acts on the correlator of the, the disorder. So this is a disorder force force correlator. So it acts on this function here, and it acts uh, in a in the functional form. So the the RG flow equation, which I'm sorry I cannot derive for you right now because then we would uh, be much over time as this form here. So you take essentially the, the function squared and then you take two derivatives. What is uh, interesting is that um, uh, if you try to find a fixed point, you realize that there's a quadratic fixed point in U which satisfies this equation. You just see if you take higher, I mean, it closes in the, in the space of polynomials of degree two written here. So the fixed point, which you have to believe me, uh, has this form. So it, it looks um, it looks like this. There is a physical interpretation to the slope you see here. Uh, it's given by moment ratio of uh, avalanches. So remember the the movie I showed you before. So you had avalanches, you had jumps, and uh, the the slope you see here is uh, the ratio of second moment of this of a jumps divided by the first moment. But for what I want to do, I just want to focus on the quadratic term here, uh, because you see when the, the quadratic term, um, so the, the constant and the linear term can never come back in the RG uh, to renormalize the quadratic term because uh, uh, you have two derivatives here. So they will drop out of the game. So you can, um, fix the uh, coefficient of the quadratic term uh, from this equation. So it, it, 
for it comes back to our G equation with one constant. So if I just try to write a theory with this one constant, and uh, for lack of time, I have uh, suppressed all the details. Um, what you end up is this theory here, where I should at least explain the variables. So remember, I said the uh, the, the disorder uh, is a function of the difference in arguments. So here, I have to put two physical copies. So I have to put two uh, different charge density waves, and they will have. So the disorder will will couple them. So I have a difference between the um, the two copies, which I call phi, and they have their center of mass. So it turns out that the center of mass somehow decouples from the game, and the only thing which remains is the center of mass. And the center of mass together with the two fermionic fields rearranges in a in a in a multiplet. The same multiplet we have seen uh, before in uh, the well, the fermionic, the mixed fermionic bosonic representation of the O n model with n equals minus two. And uh, with this, I think my time is up, and I would like to thank you for your uh, attention, and I hope that um, I hope uh, this has stimulated you guys uh, uh, to, to look into these problems. These are certainly non-unitary uh, theories, but uh, from the very exciting discussions I had with uh, uh, members from your community uh, during the workshop, I hope that we uh, can continue discussing and I'm sure we will crack this problem at, uh, at one point. Thank you. Thanks, Kai, and thanks for your uh, optimism. <laughs> ah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, if there are questions, please. Hi, okay. About this relation with the, the abelian sand pile model. So, this, this holds uh, in D equals three as well? Yes. So it's often stated that this is an example of self-organized uh, criticality. So this should correspond to some CFT without uh, relevant operator. So uh, can you comment on this? Well, it's self-organized critical, but I mean, self-organized critical, it's, it's a big word. Um, all the, also this experiment here is self-organized critical. You drive it and uh, when you stop driving, the, the system will stop. So on the sand parts, usually what you do is you take a you take a plate, you add grains uh, somewhere on, on the plate, and um, they will uh, uh, slide down. And when they fall off uh, the plate, then um, some point uh, the the movement has to stop. So in this way, they are self-organized. Actually, earthquakes are also. I mean, the the, tect the movement of tectonic plates is also self-organized. So what you do is you increase uh, the, um, the the tectonic plates they move very slowly um, so tension will build up and then tension releases and earthquake earthquakes earthquakes have a power law distribution so this is also self-organized critical it's not a magic smoking gun uh, as it as the founders of the domain have uh, made us believe it's actually quite natural phenomenon it's actually much harder uh, to drive a physical system at fixed force instead of uh, with some elastic coupling, which will always make itself organized critical. But the question is, is there anything to solve out there or is it all trivial and solved? Well, if you solve the theory, I mean, it's it's also equivalent to O minus two and uh, it has non-trivial operators. I don't know, um, I have this, uh, so that's a theory. I mean, that's that's currently what I can give you for the about the theory, and it should be also there in the in the abelian sent by model due to right. all these exact equivalences. My question is, uh, how is this the fact that you don't need to tune anything to get criticality? How is this consistent with uh, I don't know the fact that you have this scale with dimension d minus two, which is relevant? I think you should. 
I think there's no, uh, it doesn't say the self-organized critical doesn't say anything about uh, special uh, fractal dimensions. Or, or maybe it, it, it's this statement here that some of the fields are trivial. No, but somehow it should be true that this O minus two model doesn't require tuning because you just define it as a random walk. Somehow you didn't have to tune anything. You just said, well. Okay, so the, the length the of the random is walk similar. is, um, so when you, you can treat this in, in the, when you treat it in the field theory, the, in the ON model, in the 5 4 theory, then the, the charm M square here, the term M square here is a chemical potential for the length of the random wall. This is an exact statement. That's a, a, the gen transformation uh, from uh, um, polymers to the, to the ON model. So we tune this to zero, which means that we look at longer and longer um, random walk self avoiding polymers. Of course, you can take a very big polymer on this. This in corresponds spite of you to saying, <laughs> in spite of you saying that self critical is trivial, I mean, I, it's true that uh, maybe for you it's trivial, but for us it still holds some. No, I, I'm not saying it's trivial. Yeah. Um, so I expect there's somewhere to be hidden this, the operators of the, of this theory, and it's not true. I mean, these are, this is a, well, I got them from a six loop calculation. I don't have any uh, conjecture for, about exact values or so in three dimensions. So it's certainly non trivial theory, but it has some trivial as aspects. No? I mean, there are some fields which are protected, which do not get renormalized. And so this operator epsilon probably it decouples in many observables. Is that the statement when you say that it's almost free? Or uh... well, this is exact, and even the the two point function of sigma sigma is exactly the Gaussian, I mean the free theory two point function, and uh, for epsilon also. But what about OP coefficients? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the, that the two point function is free because I mean it's a CFT, so all two point functions look the same anyway. But uh, in terms of couplings, did you well, I mean, if you do the OPE of epsilon of uh, this guy, you should probably get something non trivial. If you do it uh, of two sigma, then you will get epsilon, and there's nothing interesting out there. It's just Gaussian free theory. Some. But I think Miguel, as far as I can see, this theory does have a relevant singular operator. So this emergence, uh, this self-organized phenomenon, somehow we like sometimes to say that self-organized criticality should respond to theory without relevant singlets, but here it's not the case clearly because there is this term in bilinear, it's total singlet and it, it, it is relevant. So there so, must be some other magic. This one has dimension one and three dimension one. This yeah. tensor is a little bit higher up in the spectrum. And I mean, you probably you probably don't like to do it, take the ON model and then continue and analytically to some strange numbers. You can always take two fermions and one boson, perfectly fine. No, no, but okay, but the question was different. It's just uh, it's kind of in in our fields. The question was about the self-organized thing. So that's like at the formal level, we, we see that everything works fine. It was just some interpretation questions. Is that if I understand correctly? Yeah, but we can sit together and uh, yeah. try to figure out what you have to simulate in the, the big and sent by model uh, to to see, uh, for instance, this operator here.
Sorry, I have a nice question. Can you go back in uh, slide nine about the long range uh, easing? I mean, uh, are you? I mean, are we sure that uh, the, uh, when there is a fixed point which is different from the easing, uh, it is conformal invariant? Because when you have a non-local uh, action, typically you can have a scale invariance and a non-conformal invariant theory, right? Yeah, so I mean, the, the RG tells you it's scale invariant, and then you ask Slava, and he tells you it's conformal invariant. Okay, so Slava, you tell me that it's conformal invariant. Uh, well, it's a bit of a special case. Uh, we studied this. Uh, we studied this conformal invariance question. I mean, so we have a paper about that, but basically. It's a special case, which is due to the fact that this non-locality is, is all in this bilinear term. So this can be used to argue that this theory is actually conformal invariant. And okay, there are many ways to, to argue this, some more rigorous than others, but for example, a quick and dirty, but not rigorous way is to say that you can always represent this non-local bilinear term as a local term in a, in a higher number of dimensions. And but so this I mean, restores locality and then you can, and then the usual arguments apply. Okay, but I mean, like, for example, uh, you know, there is this uh, example of uh, the Brion motion is a conformal invariant, but the fractional Brion motion is not. The fraction, okay. I don't know what you mean by fractional Brownian motion. Fraction, so Brownian motion is like a motion where an action has with, a, with alpha equal to. A Brownian and what motion is fractional has... Brownian motion? Hmm? And what is fractional Brownian motion? When you replace the derivative with the fractional one. Yeah, so I think when mathematicians like, uh, say that uh, this fractional Brownian motion is not conformal invariant, I, I think they are applying some notion of conformal invariance which is yeah, uh, mathem mathematical, uh, mathematical which is which is not what we mean by it. it's a bit of a restricted motion for example yeah. uh, brownian motion has this property that if you take you can study the probability for the brownian motion to go from a point to a point or you can study the probability for the brownian motion to go from a region to a region Mm -hmm. And both of these things for the usual Brownian motion in 2D are conformally invariant. But if you go to 3D or if you go to a fractional Brownian motion, then you can still study amplitudes to go from a point to a point and they will be perfectly conformally invariant. But if you study the probability to go from a region to a region, they will not be conformally invariant. For so just. You for the trivial reason that the scaling dimension of phi is no longer zero, and so you don't just. And mathematicians get sometimes confused about it, and they say, "Oh no, even like Brownian motion in three D is not conformally invariant." Which is because they they say they look to the total measure. They look the, at they they look at the, the class of observables. So conformal invariance tells you that certain observables nicely. Okay, so yeah, they, they when they say this, they say this to the total measure of the curve. Yeah, so they apply it to, to some big set of observables, and yeah, and then it's not, uh, but that's just because they themselves create okay. a problem. Okay, this is interesting. So this theory is as a field theory at the fixed point, we believe that it is conformal invariant. Oh, it's like when it is conformal invariant, so it's okay for me. Uh, Okay, but, so we, by the way, we have, we move uh, to the, here we move to the amphitheater because uh, Connor will give a talk uh, from the amphitheater. Uh, but I will open, uh, I will keep the same, uh, we keep uh, the, the Zoom link open. So while here we are moving uh, from the rooms to the amphitheater, I keep the discussion open if you want. Maybe there are still more questions. Than exactly. Hi, I have a question on uh, the first part of your talk about the resummation techniques. 
So the, 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 the Borrello summation, the, the various the, the techniques you have, you assume that the, the, the series is uh, Borrello summable, that there is a finite radius of convergence of the Borrello transform, right? Yes. Uh, but uh, what about a theory where you don't know if it is Borrello summable or maybe it is not Borrello summable? Then you just uh, left with Padé or can you try? No, no, Padé, I mean, you see Padé, it just gives you a bunch of curves and um, they have nothing to do with the real with the real uh, function right real world I mean, um, you can i mean this is this example because you can uh, work it completely out you know this can i mean there are i didn't write it but these are analytically known functions you can do large uh, coupling expansion i mean you can do every game you want to play you can put, play with it and uh, you can try a body resummation. It just does not work. Uh -huh. It's far off. I mean, uh, it brought a one, two, three, maybe still okay. But then um, if you go to higher orders, it's just uh, completely useless. Right. And so uh, then in this case, you did. Right. And, but, I mean, I showed you how to, to, to right. evaluate the synthetic behavior here. And the theory, which is of the type uh, phi four. I mean, yeah. The power of the interaction, it will have exactly this n factorial. Yes, yes. Now, the, the example I have in mind is the gross novoi field theory because uh, I think, uh, or at least I don't know if it is a border assumable, and people have just done a Padera summation of the theory. And so I wonder if one can do better than that. But, uh, but look, I mean, the way I, I, I myself, I mean, approached the game because it was a big history and there was a the company had sponsor a scheme out there and they had spent, I mean, they do this on, on clusters of computers. And uh, I, I had this one series and I wanted to see how it works and whether it's really asymptotic in, in, the, in the sense that this a n, if I'm divided by n factorial, goes to some constant to the n. So mm -hmm. what did I do? I, I plotted the ratio of n plus one divided by i n and this in factorial taken out before. And I saw this actually converge pretty nicely against the number. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I said, well, okay, let's try to do something. So I, uh, I, I used a function to, to fit this convergence. And then I used that to get some more orders in the expansion, which I of course guessed, mm -hmm. but it made uh, the, the borrow uh, resummation much more stable. So if you guessed a little bit this GC wrong, so for instance, you went somewhere here, you still got a decent result. I see. So I mean, you, you can you can play the game if it's a decent series and you should see that if you look at a n over a n plus one and take after taking out the n factorial before. Mm -hmm. If it grows to a constant, I mean, it has to be a negative constant. This has to be an alternating sum. Uh, then you're probably fine. I see. I see. I don't know how, how many orders you have in your example. I think there are already four loops, uh, like four or... Four loops, yeah. And four loops, maybe you can start to get a glimpse. Right. That, that's, that's why, uh, yeah, there's four loops there are, yes. So that, that's why I, I think uh, one should try at least to do a better work. So I mean, here we, I mean, we did this in, uh, with uh, Misha, we did this in, in six loop. And then uh, recently, uh, Oliver Schnetz calculated seven loops. And we look at this series and, uh, well, it seems to um, make results worse. So we are a little puzzled. So there are two possibilities. So either uh, even order somehow work better than uh, if you just have the odd orders or there's actually a small bug somewhere in, in some of their diagrams. Um, but since the effort to calculate them grows exponentially, I mean, it's very hard to, uh, to check. Yes, yeah. There is actually a comment in the chat by Andre Fedorenko says uh, that the four minus epsilon should be border assumable, the gross number you cover. So. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I mean, this. Um, you see here, you get this, but it's it's combinatorics of Dick's theorem. I mean, how many yeah. possibilities are here to 
to combine the 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 x I mean the, the x fields which is called x but could be a, a field <laughs> and for fermions you can get lucky and have a cancellation because you get additional minus signs but should not be worse mm -hmm. there are examples when series actually get converging i see okay thank you you're welcome Well, if uh, there are no more questions, then maybe I, I unshare the screen so that uh, Connor can do this. But I think we get a 10 minute coffee break now. Somebody should stop the recording. Yeah, Raul, can you? Uh,